So this is this Walkman I showed you before. We can't really call it a Walkman because it's not a Sony. So we'll call it a portable cassette stereo recorder and it has a radio AM FM stereo radio built in. And it doesn't work because um, parts were stolen off of it to fix a TV. We'll get into that in a bit. I'm interested to see if I can get this thing rewired and working properly. So let's check it out. This is an MTC model eight. 94R stereo radio cassette recorder. A boom box without the boom. It's got a mono speaker. It uh, has an AM FM radio and it has a stereo cassette recorder built in. Metal chassis. MTC stood for Master Technical Company. I think that's what it stood for. Um, anyway, um, back in the 1980s, these things were competing with um, Sony, with their Walkman. So all these other companies came out with competing products to compete with Sony for the Walkman. And there was all kinds of different brands, and MTC was one of them that uh, was quite quite a popular lower cost option to buying a Sony Walkman. This unit here I received a couple of years ago from a fellow that basically had me cannibalize it. He had a, I think there's a video on his TV that I serviced, but he had broken the headphone jack and he insisted that I cannibalize this player to take a headphone jack out of this and to make his player or his TV work. And then he left this behind. So I have no idea if it works or not. We're going to find that out today together. If it doesn't, I'm going to try and make the thing work. And uh, I, I'm not going to put a second headphone jack, obviously, in there. But if, if one set of headphone jacks works, then uh, that will be fine. So let's see whether we can uh, make this thing work. I'll try the radio. Radio is on. But I don't hear any volume. So probably it's the speaker is disconnected. In the back here, I'll have to rewire the headphone jack so that uh, at least we get some sound out of the speakers. I'm curious as to whether I get any sound at all from the uh, the output. So we'll, we'll plug this in to the amplifier and see whether I get any sound from the one jack that remains. which it appears that I do. Not working right, of course, but at least we have a place to start with. Okay, so at least we know that the radio part's working. Um, let's see if we can figure out why it's uh, not giving a, a signal. It's going to be the, the jack and it's probably not connected because I forget what I did when I put this thing back together. I think I just threw it together. I have to say I wasn't, I wasn't thrilled with scrapping a perfectly good working unit, especially something like this because uh, today something like this is not all that common. And even though it was not a Sony, it's still a cassette recorder. Um, radio in a portable form and that is not common. I mean back in the day when these things were sold this would have been a, a considered a, a cheap alternative to a Walkman and people would have thrown these things out as you know as soon as they had a problem this this would be the first thing that got scrapped. You know, they wouldn't even attempt to have fixed this. The shop that I worked at, if someone walked in the door with one of these things and asked us to fix it, they would have been laughed out of the store. So, because of that, I'm sure most of these went in the garbage. And there's probably not very many that are still working around, if any. So that gives me even more reason to uh, want to 
try and save this one and make it work. And I think all the problems are going to be right here in the uh, where the jacks are, are connected here. I see there's a black wire off here. I wonder where this goes. Does it go to the ground? Okay, maybe it goes. That wire might go to the ground here. Or to one of these terminals. Go somewhere in here. Yeah, it might go to this wire here. It might go to that right down to this ground. Or whatever this is here. Is this a ground? It looks like it could be a ground. It looks like this wire goes to the ground here, so let's just stick it on there. It looks like the antenna goes to that same place and one of the terminals to the speaker goes to that same place. Interesting, but it looks like it goes here. one of these terminals but where it goes I don't know it was just lying loose in here it probably does go to one of these terminals and then there's the speaker wire here I think the place I can see it going is to this one right here. And the speaker wire is going to this one of the jacks here. I don't know. I don't know if it's that one or one of the other ones. Ah, maybe it's this one here. That sounds a little better. This kind of thing. But uh, the U.S. regards China as being particularly uh, culpable for. Okay, so there's been a number of cases where Chinese or people associated with China have been found to be uh, collecting information or gathering certain kinds of data which they shouldn't have had, taking it home, and so on. There's been all kinds of arguments about this, about whether those cases were really industrial espionage or not. But this is now being portrayed and put together to form a picture of okay. you know this kind of new emerging techno-political world in which China and the USA are competing um, to lead the world in these areas. Mm -hmm. So that's what, I think what it's all about, basically. That's what it comes down to. And I think I can really see Eric Schmidt's influence in a lot of this, you know, this uh, data nationalism that's going on right now. It to uh, it's working out of the speaker. It's working out of the headphone. Of the world, well, but it's right? only... He likes to see enemies. He likes to have enemies. And of course, it's only coming out of one speaker, the right channel. No, good reason to say that China is the enemy by somebody who's much more intelligent than him. <laughs> uh, another wrinkle in this whole thing is that this past week, the Chinese government announced this proposal was saying, among other things, that it won't require companies to share data from overseas operations. 
if that violates the country's laws and that it won't, for example, use tech companies to access sensitive data or engage in mass surveillance. So does this potentially answer the U.S. or, or other countries' objections? I think it's a very clever move, actually. Uh, it's really sort of taken the, the wind out of those U.S. Because, you know, and they're putting this forward not just as a kind of bilateral deal between the USA and China. What they're proposing is a whole new global order, right? They're actually proposing new global rules for how data management, how data collection could work. Which, you know, if you're in the kind of academic or activist field, they don't look too bad. Actually. So I'm just doing some tracing with my scope here, looking for what is what. This looks like this yellow line is uh, output. This is the speaker line here. So I'm only getting one channel right now, but I think this yellow output is the other channel. So I'm just going to connect it up to this speaker jack. Um, this one here is switched from that one when there's nothing plugged in. So I'm going to hook the speaker up to this terminal here. And uh, turn the radio on. I should get sound. Ah, right there. Okay, now I've got sound through the speaker. And when I plug in the headphones, I should get sound through my stereo, in stereo. Which I do, and it shuts off the speaker. I switched to a different cord just because I thought that, uh, I thought that maybe this adapter was bad, but the adapter's fine. It was just, it was just the uh, wiring was wrong here. There we go. Aha! That part's working. So now I've got stereo sound through the speakers. And mono sound through the built-in speaker. So that part's working. I wonder if the tape deck works. I gotta like this thing. Look at this. Look at how complex it is. There's a little pulley over here for the tuning string. It's got a tuning dial that goes from here around the tuner and then back down through this pulley and then back down the other side. This would be a real tough one to change a belt on if it needed to be changed because uh, you wouldn't be able to pull the circuit board out very easily. Uh, I'm trying to remember how I got this thing. I think I took the face off when I took the jack out, so I didn't take the board out. And I did put the wires back where they came from at the time when I uh, put this thing back together. And the guy, when I was taking the phone, headphone jack out, he's wondering, why are you bothering putting the wires back on? Because he was told me just to throw this out, right? I didn't tell him I was going to try and get it working again. But it looks like I've got it going now with just the one, the one jack, and it's doing what it's supposed to. It's turning off the speaker when it's uh, when there's a headphone plugged in. So I'm just going to set that back on there just for now just so it doesn't get damaged. I want to try out the tape recorder on this thing. See I think this thing is cool because it has a speaker and an AM FM radio so for um, and a tape player. So as far as uh, as a collectible item goes I think this is kind of a collectible item just because it's kind of unique. It has both an AM FM stereo radio and a cassette recorder, not just a player, and it has a speaker. How cool is that? Let's just see whether, first of all, whether the uh, whether the tape transport operates, whether the belts are any good on here. So let's just try play and see whether anything moves. And indeed, it does it does move so that means that the belt and the motor is probably okay there's a mechanical auto stop so when I press this little lever in it should stop and it doesn't it doesn't stop caps are still turning now that might be that might be that the play idler is a bit weak oh it's got lots of torque why didn't it stop oh now it did hmm that's interesting what it does when this lever is pulled into place it actually trips this little lever here as you'll see and that's supposed to trip it but it didn't that time but one time it did it's supposed to push this over and eject or, or hit the eject or hit the stop button 
but it doesn't. That's weird. All it's doing is it's stopping this from turning, even though there's plenty of torque on here. It may be that there's not quite enough. Yeah, that's what it is. It's, it's probably just the little idler there is uh, is worn out a bit. But let's check out Rewind, which Rewind has lots of torque. And Fast Forward has a fair bit of torque. Should be enough to move a tape. Let me go. Button flew off there. That'll have to be glued back on. I'm just going to uh, put a couple screws in the back to hold it together. I'm going to dig up a tape and I'm going to uh, see whether this thing actually does anything, whether it actually plays and records. I just want to put a couple screws in the back here just to, just to keep the thing from falling apart while I'm working on it. And I don't know which screws go where. Some of these are probably longer than others. I have a tape here that a buddy gave me. It's probably got Greek music on it. That's okay because it's only going to get erased anyway. But let's just see whether it plays anything. And then we'll see if it records. Where's the volume on this thing? It's gonna... That's not a good sign. Unless it's that switch. Maybe that switch is... play switch Try recording on this tape. doesn't appear to record or play might be the switch too over here interesting okay well I guess we have some more work to do on this thing I was hoping it was going to be easy but it looks like the tape deck has a bit of a problem Well, it does record. It doesn't record very well. A little bit of wild flutter there. Uh, I'm sure the belt is probably probably in pretty sad shape on this thing. Hmm. Wonder how I go about changing that. First thing, sir, I've disconnected the speaker just so the wires don't break. I'm going to give these switches here a little shot of cleaner because I'm sure all these switches need to be cleaned. I was wondering what the easiest way to get into them was going to be. 
I don't want to remove this board if I don't have to. Just because I know that that, that tuning dial is going to come apart. The string's going to come off there. And it's going to be fun to try and put it back on. I take out the screw. This looks like it lifts off. This thing uses long and short screws throughout it, which is a kind of a pain in the butt. That lifts off. That lifts off there. And then this piece should lift out of here somehow to expose those controls. I guess I have to lift this top piece off too to get at it. See what I mean? Some of these screws are really long. wonder why because certainly don't need to be that long but now this piece should come off the top like that ah now this lifts off now I can get into those switches to give them all a shot of cleaner oh, there's a microphone on the front of this thing too that's what these wires are for those are for the microphone Oops. Oh, hold on. That's a microphone plug. I think that was the microphone plug I was plugged into. Okay. Where's my sound? Where did my sound go?
Man, that's bad. That oh, was the belt or the motor. Probably the belt. It's slipping. Try cleaning it up a bit and see what happens. Okay, I just cleaned up the belt a bit with some isopropyl. Let's see if it records any better now. I haven't cleaned the record place switch yet either, but I just want to see if it records any better and if it, uh, if I've got the wild flutter any better now that, than I did before. Because it was pretty bad. I want to avoid pulling this board out of all possible to change the belt. Because A, I doubt whether I've got a belt for it, but B, it's going to be a pain in the butt to put it all back together. Should be enough. See, it rewinds and everything, and it fast forwards fine. Flutter is pretty bad. Yeah, I probably will have to try and change out that belt. It has an eject lever on it too to lift the tape up, which is kind of unusual. I'm gonna play a tape back on this, a pre recorded. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Curious is if I can lift this board up enough without without taking off the dial string because that's the last thing I want to do is remove that dial string. I feel about the same way that everybody else feels about restringing dial strings. It's uh, not my most favorite thing to do. And I don't think anybody enjoys it. Just because it's always a pain. I just don't know whether I'm going to be able to get enough clearance to see where that belt goes. Looks like there, there, look, might, there might be even two belts in this thing, so yeah, this might be a real, a real dog's breakfast to change that belt. Hmm. I'll try some more belt dressing and see whether that will uh, help it at all, because I really don't want to go down that road of having to take this thing all apart to change it. That's the last thing I want to do is change this belt. I've made up my mind. It is uh, going to be ugly. Unlike a Sony, they don't have all the places marked where the screws go, so you kind of have to remember where they came out of. But I might get lucky with some belt dressing. The belt's not broken, it's not stretched, it's just slipping a bit. Ah, I put the wrong screw in. I was supposed to put that longer screw in there. These stupid things that have got you know one long screw and one short screw drive me crazy. It's just ridiculous. Master technology, my ass. You know, like, I think the damn screw's the same length. 
Stupid design. See what I mean? One long screw and one short screw. And you always get it in the wrong place. And then the short, short screw won't come back out because uh, there's nothing to, nothing for it to uh, thread into. It's just a stupid design. If you put the wrong screw in, you put the long screw in where a short screw is supposed to go, it'll, it'll go in, but quite often it'll do damage. Like it'll either be sticking out into the cassette compartment as that one would, so I wouldn't be able to load a cassette, or it, it'll break something. It's just... It's just a kind of a stupid design. If you ask me, Even that one looks to be too long. It's sticking out through the cassette compartment. I think that was supposed to be an even shorter screw than that. Let's find a shorter one. Yeah, see that's that's the length of that one. Yeah, it's a uh, So I'm just going to put some belt dressing on this thing. Now, belt dressing is just a it's a, a sticky compound that uh, it's made up of ether and a few other things, and uh, it basically um, it softens and makes the belt sticky. It's kind of like rubber renew, but it's not the same stuff. So let me just try some of that. Now I can't really tell you what this belt dressing compound is that I've got because it's not a commercial product it was made up for me probably 30 years ago by a chemist it smells like xylene that's what the odor is on it I've just got it in a, a, a little glass bottle that says belt dressing on it so I don't show it because people are gonna ask me where do you get it you don't okay you don't get it it's it's like rubber renew but it's not as aggressive as rubber renew if you put rubber renew on a belt you're gonna probably melt the belt and then the belt is gonna be shot it but it's it's kind of like rubber renew it just makes the belt a little tacky uh, you could probably get similar results by putting some by dressing it with some rosin the problem is rosin is really sticky and it can end up causing the belt to stick to the pulley but uh, it's it's similar. It's it's kind of like it's it's kind of a bit sticky, like the liquid rosin, but it has a smell of uh, it smells like xylene, and, and I don't know what's in it. I, I couldn't tell you what's in it. I don't use it very often, but sometimes sometimes you have to. So I'm just letting that thing work in. We'll we'll put the uh, I'll put my test tone on here. We'll see if the speed has come up on this at all. It's been working in there for a few minutes. So this is my 440 tone. Still sounds like crap, but at least it's going about the right speed now. A little bit, uh, 441, 429, and yeah, that wild flutter is going to, of course, make that jump all over the place, but at least uh, that part's working better. belts in bad shape. See, after it's working its way in a bit. It's getting a little bit better. We'll just let that work in for a bit and see. See, it's getting better. 
The wound flutter is going down. So there it is now playing. Okay, still a little bit of wild flutter, but you know what? It's good enough. I think I'm complete. I'm done on this one. I'll let the speaker hook up the speaker, hook up the antenna again, and put it together and see if it works once I get it together. So of course this has a built-in microphone right here. So we'll see how it records uh, my voice through the built-in mic. So of course this has a built-in microphone right here. So let's see how it records uh, my voice through the built-in mic. And it does. I would say it's 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 good enough. It's working adequately now. A little bit of flutter still, but oh well. It is what it is. Um, I don't think I'm going to go any further on this. I'm, I'm sure people are going to give me thumbs down just because I'm not going to try and find a belt for it. <clears throat> About the only thing that I would ever use this thing for, ever, is a portable radio to listen to AM and FM. Like if there's a power failure. That's about the only thing I'm ever going to use this thing for. So as, as far as my use of this, it's going to just be used as a radio. I don't use cassettes. I don't record anything on cassettes. I don't listen to cassettes. I couldn't care less whether the cassette deck works, but the radio part, that is a good thing to have because if there's a power failure, you're not gonna be listening to the radio on your phone if there's no power. And uh, especially if there's no data because of course all the cell sites are, uh, are powered up by local hydro. The Generator back cell sites back at the main uh, the main cell towers are kind of far away, so the signal won't be very good. But the problem is when there's a power failure, and you've got the circuit I'm on has 2,777 houses. So when you have 2,777 people that all of a sudden don't have cellular coverage and their phones are trying to connect to the tower that's a couple kilometers away, you can imagine how congested it gets. So as far as trying to stream anything um, to find out what's going on, um, you need a you need a battery powered radio. So that was the that was the goal was to get this thing working. I didn't even care about the headphones. As long as I got it working with the speaker, that was all I cared about. And it works. So let's put it together. There we go. FM and AM full of noise. There's things in here that make noise too. Like lights. There we go. That's my little my little test transmitter. My little AM stereo test transmitter. Hey, still sounds great. And the same thing, let's just pick it on my little FM thing that, that's down here. Oh, wrong band, wrong button. Same thing. There we go, it's fixed. And it will do everything that I want it for. A portable radio with a speaker for use, you know, like when the power goes out. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed looking at this little kind of unique piece of equipment that uh, has been around for years. And it was out to compete with the Walkman from the 1980s probably built a little bit better than some of the some of the later ones anyway and as I say the the tape deck still and if I plug it in
There we go. All done. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye for now.